kick it off? Uh, we are now live. All right. Great. All right. So me... Good evening, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us again. Uh, the Milwaukee Pearl Mongers are proud mm -hmm. to present another evening of Pearl, this time with Jay Knapp, talking about Catalyst. Um, we're very honored to have him uh, speak to us remotely on, on the On Air Hangouts. Um, Joe, uh, JNAP is the current uh, maintainer of Catalyst, and so he definitely knows what he's talking about. Um, I'm very interested in Catalyst, as well as a lot of fellow pro mongers here in Milwaukee, because a lot of us use Catalyst on a daily basis in our day jobs. So he's going to help us <coughs> correct some bad habits, I understand, with uh, the way Catalyst components are used, and uh, some other understanding with Catalyst, even if you're new to it. So uh, thank you very much, John, for joining us, and uh, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, okay, great. So um, just a quick intro. Since we're recording this and it's possible people might watch it uh, without having any, any idea of exactly what Catalyst is. So Catalyst is a model view uh, controller um, web framework uh, similar to many other MVC frameworks you may have heard of, like Rails and, and so forth. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a, a somewhat older project, um, but it falls within what we call the modern Perl era which is uh, a, a, a time period uh, in the Perl um, history, uh, starting in around 2004, 2005, uh, where there was a renewed focus uh, for people using the language on best practices, and, and I'm bringing Perl into the modern era. Uh, so Catalyst was a, was, was, was a founding, actually, member of that, uh, of, of that movement, um, and uh, it's, um, it's, a, it's a web framework that is used a lot in companies, um, and uh, it powers a lot of like internal applications, uh, both uh, websites and APIs. Uh, I've had the opportunity to use it for a number of companies. Um, and uh, it's although it's 10 years old, uh, it's by no means a legacy uh, system. Uh, there are people still building basically brand new applications with their applications. Uh, in fact, I'm working right now on an application that's just about a year old. Uh, so um, it's a modern framework. So uh, that so that being said, uh, let's kick off the presentation. Let's see. Get the uh, screen going. Okay. Um, are my slides popping up? I should say Catalyst Components. Lifecycle Looks good. Looks good? Great, yeah. great. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk about uh, components within Catalyst. Uh, it's one of the parts of Catalyst we use all the time, but possibly maybe people are covering the whole thing code without really understanding what it what it's all about. So. Uh, and this is a beta presentation. Uh, my intention here is to use you all as guinea pigs uh, to review it, uh, to throw my worst possible stuff at you um, and see what sticks. Uh, and you guys give me some good feedback. Um, and if it all goes great, um, perhaps I'll get to do a cleaned up version of this at Yaxi this year. Uh, and if it totally sucks, then maybe not. So uh, as I said, beta, so forgive me, it's a little rough at some points. OK, so <clears throat> in order to to start talking about Catalyst components, I want to take a step back and talk about design patterns within Catalyst. So when I say design patterns, I'm talking about like classic gang of four design patterns. Uh, can somebody give me an example of a classic gang of four design pattern? Got an example. Oh, command pattern. <laughs> command pattern. Command pattern, great. And what is a command pattern? Can you elaborate? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You actually came up with one that I forgot. It's actually in Catalyst, so I'll take a note. <laughs> yeah, it's a pattern. It's a PX method. So, you know, I think one of the things that you should be able to do with it is to build a uh, undo command. So it's, I know I've seen it recently in like um, redo command, and like an under something like that. Right. So the idea is that you might want to take something uh, relatively complicated um, uh, or a group of things that are similar but complicated and put them behind a, a uniform interface, right? Quite, quite often it's like a... I'm sorry, go ahead, I'm cutting you off. No, go ahead. So, you know, you have a uniform interface. Uh, it's, it's an object. Usually you have a method called run or execute or something like that. Uh, and and uh, that's used to, to, to pull together. That's, I'm glad you threw that one out because that's... One that's in Catalyst that I didn't that I forgot about. Uh, at the very top, we should write a command pattern because um, when I say a, an action Catalyst, so we all know when I say what an action is in Catalyst. Yeah, I think a lot of people know what an action is. So, like in right in Catalyst, um, you know, you have a method uh, that's associated with a URL, 
And uh, that actually is a, a great example of command pattern because behind every action, there's a catalyst action instance. Uh, so there's that would fit in. I forgot about it. Uh, object oriented is it's, it's a classic uh, um, pattern for design and uh, a catalyst. It's a model view control framework, but it's it's object oriented behind the scenes. So controllers are just objects, components are just objects, and we'll go into components in a bit. It's objects all the way down. Even actions are, are objects. Uh, and uh, as a result, you can take advantage of everything that's great about um, creating objects in Perl. Uh, model view controller, this is a granddaddy component. Um, it's, it's what they call a compound component because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a compound um, uh, uh, pattern because it's actually built on top of several other patterns. Uh, but in model view controller, it's, it's an, uh, the idea is that you're you're building a complex system and you're breaking it into separate pieces. The model piece is just expressing the, the business logic. Uh, the view is expressing the logic around somebody interacting with it. And the controller is, is a bit of logic that sits uh, between the model and the view and, and mediates uh, with the user. And each one of these pieces is supposed to do just one thing. Uh, and the idea is that you're promoting reusability, you're promoting good separation of concerns, and uh, well-designed, well-decoupled applications. Um, chain of command. Uh, so in in, Cat, in in Catalyst, we have action chain, uh, where you can uh, you can you can stretch your request across several actions. Uh, and uh, the next two, a service locator and dependency injection. That's the one I'm going to be spending the most time talking about today. Uh, so let's uh, let's get right into talking about a service location and dependency injection. All right. So uh, here's an example of what a controller could look like. Uh, this is a controller that has a, an action called list uh, that's getting a, uh, a result set of users and is going to do something with it. I return it to view or something. Uh, so we're looking at this, everyone, and what's wrong with it? Can anybody tell me what's bad about this? Just because I wrote it doesn't mean it's good. Go <laughs> treat it with well, I don't like how it builds a schema every time the list action is called. Yes, yeah, building a schema, right? So that's, I mean, basically what's going on here is that uh, uh, just in order to for for this action to do its job, to get the user results set, and then to do whatever else it's going to do with it, uh, it's it's creating the schema instance, and it, it's all hard coded, right? <laughs> you know, to do whatever the the, the local system is, uh, and it's all kind of put together here. So it doesn't promote reusability. Uh, every place that, if you were going to follow a pattern like this, everywhere you needed the schema, you'd end up doing the same thing over and over and over again. Uh, and if you change the database, and you'd have to you know, search and replace everywhere. Uh, it makes the code harder to read because you have all this noise, you know, repeated bits. Now, you could try to get around this by doing things like, I don't know, making a role that, had, that exposes the schema attribute, right? That's just one way. And then every control that needed it would consume that role. Uh, that doesn't quite satisfy because it kind of really, it kind of really confuses confuses the interface, right? Um, so when you're actually programming in Catalyst, uh, what you usually do is something that looks a lot like this. This must look a little bit more familiar to all of you. Is that uh, is this seeming this looking a little bit better? Yep. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I could be wrong, you know. I'm going to throw out some, some. I'm going to say some stupid stuff just to make sure that you guys correct me. <laughs> all right. So, first of all, we've gotten rid of all the all those um, extra bits. We're not creating the schema here. We don't have to use DBI. We're not using the PG DVD. Okay. We're not we're not using the schema directly in the controller. We're getting access to our information via this method called model. Okay, which is going to go do a service lookup uh, against a, a tag. In this case, we have a thing called schema user. Now, when Catalyst starts up, it's gonna it, it goes around and it, it prepares all these services, all these components, and it puts them into a registry so that you can get at them. Okay, so that that is sort of the heart of the concept of a service lookup. Now, what's great about this is not only have we have we reduced the amount of code that we have to have all over the place. But we are now programming to an interface, not to an implementation. So let me go back. I'm sorry. Uh, we're programming. 
Okay, so here. So what do I mean by that? Well, we're asking down here on this line where it says my user RS. Now, because we're doing a service lookup here, that could be anything, right? It just has to conform to the expected interface. Whereas previously, we are we are working against an actual specific instance, right? So that means things like with this version here, the improved version, you could create a mock version of the schema user for testing that just simply provides the interface but doesn't actually do any database data, right? So you're promoting strong decoupling. Again, programming to an interface, not to an implementation. That's something you hear all the time. Catalyst makes it easy. And the other piece that's going on here is that you are now decoupling instance creation from usage. So what does that mean? So going back, so here, in order to get access to the user result set, we have to create the instances, okay? Whereas in the version that we all used to using, and we probably use this all the time, we are asking the application framework to do the instantiation for us. And by doing that, not only does it give us the ability to do things like I mentioned before, perhaps we create a mocked version, a mocked instance for testing, but you can also decouple every aspect of the creation. All these pieces here, like the database name, uh, the host, the port, the username, the password, the fact that it's a Postgres database, all those pieces have been deferred to the application to be decided. That means that if you can very quickly change those things in one place, and as long as you continue to have a path, a consistent interface, you can completely change the underlying implementation. Again, it promotes growth and decoupling. So they, both these yeah. concepts are, are, are happening. So those are that's what I'm talking about, again, going back to service location dependency injection. Why are those great things to have in Catalyst? Right off the top, it, it makes it easy to do the right thing with the creating instances. Hey, John. Yeah, go ahead. Whoa, the, the echo is getting pretty bad over here. Um, if you go back one slide. Go back a slide. OK, I'm here. <coughs> Why do you have the extends line highlighted? Uh, that was uh, This is just the uh, when I was doing my highlighting uh, of the code. I had this tool, and this is how it came out. So OK. I, if, it's dis if it's distracting, definitely say so, because uh, maybe I need to use a different highlighter. Uh, well, that, that was, I was yeah. wondering if something had changed there. And then when you switched back to the previous slide, I noticed it hadn't. And so now my eyes were tricking me thinking that that had been some important line. But clearly it, it wasn't. I, yeah, just note for reference then. Yeah, I probably need to have a different highlighting scheme for the syntax. I wasn't in love with this either, but I, I, I had it all in black and white, and I thought, ah, oh, it's kind of ugly. You're using, uh, um, this. you're using pigments? Yeah. Yeah, that happens. Didn't, didn't quite, didn't quite have come out quite. I'm probably going to end up having to fool around with it manually. OK. Uh, but what about this part here where I gray out the pieces that got changed? Is that cool? That's, or good, that... that's good. OK. That's good. Great. Uh, any other questions about this before I move on? OK. All right, so again, two great ideas. Interface over an implementation, and you're decoupling your creation from usage. I, I do need to point out there's a downside to this. Uh, going back to here, um, it, does, it does create a little bit of I don't know. It's just something the programmer needs to learn. You know, like if you're not if you're not used if you don't know about it, you might prefer this because at least this you know what it's doing. But a, a pro programmer coming to Catalyst is going to need to understand what, what's happening here. So it's part of the when people say Catalyst has got a bit of a learning curve, that's part of it, right? So that's really the big the main downside. There's tons and tons of upsides to it, but the major downside here is that it can make it can make understanding the code a little bit harder, and of course you're you're hitting that immediate cognitive dissonance as a as a user that's new to the system. All right, so we're going to talk about components, right? So I uh, here we said that that, that the model was was retrieving um, was using service lookup to return a component or to call a component that's going to give us this user result set, right? So What's a component? In Catalyst, all that the component is is very simple. It's just an object. It's a class with a defined interface. Now, I do encourage people uh, to go look at Catalyst component uh, on CPAIN and look over the code. I'm going to warn you that there's some wacky stuff in there because you remember Catalyst is 10 years old. And when we did the conversion to Moose, 
there were some things that were done, you know, that were more about backward compatibility. So there's some, there's going to be some hacks inside that code, but you need to like look past it, okay? Um, when you go to when you go to look at that, I'm going to show you in a moment the parts of it that are the most important. Now, when I say it's an object with a defined interface, ideally you should just be able to program to the interface. But again, because Catalyst is a little bit older and it's pre-Moose, I always tell people that it's it's smartest to actually inherit from Catalyst component directly. There are places in the code and there are plugins and stuff around that don't look for an interface. They actually say is the instance is a Catalyst component, which is unfortunate, but that's just the case. Okay, so uh, just inherit from Catalyst component when you're building your your when you're building your components uh, to to be on the safe side. Again, someday maybe it would be great if we have a level component role and, and you can you could code to the interface as opposed to a specific implementation, but that's where we are right now. Okay, so again, like I said, I recommend everybody go take a look at Catalyst Component and, and, and try to play with the code and understand it, but I want to give you some context understanding what's going on in there. This is really the part of it, of the parts of Catalyst Component um, that, are, that are the meat of 99% of what's happening, okay? So, there's three methods that you should care about, config, component, a component, and accept context. And of the three, two of them are required, and one of them is an option, okay? So what is config? Um, config is a class accessor that is giving you, that is basically returning a hash ref of the configuration information associated with the component, okay? So again, we know what I talked before about, like, you're, you're deferring the creation of the component to the application, that means the configuration for it is going to be stored there. Now, uh, and as a result, we have a configuration method inside a component. And they always say, like, when you're, you know, it's, it's best when you're writing, when you're working with a model or a component, you don't pull this method yourself directly. Now, the next piece here is component. And all that component, the method component does is, component is called by your application class when the application is starting up. When you're starting up a Catalyst application, it's, at first it calls setup, and setup calls a bunch of setup underscore methods, okay? Uh, and one of them is called setup components. And when setup components gets hit, it goes and it finds all the components in your application. What I mean is, it's looking, it's finding all the views, all the model, all the controllers, all the names of all of them, and it's going through each one, and it's instantiating it, okay? Actually, something slightly more complicated happens than that, but stick with that mental model. Set of components is, is going through and it's registering and it's creating each of these components. And it does that not by calling new directly on the class. It calls component on the class. Component calls new for you, okay? So the idea here is that the component is an interface exposed to Catalyst for the sole purposes of creating the instance that gets registered. Right? And this method gets the class name, so you can call new against it, and it gets two more pieces, two more bits of, of stuff. The first one is the application, okay, so in other words, the, the unblessed application, right, uh, the object. And the configuration is associated with this, right? So in other words, if you, if you, have, if you use, like, say, config loader, or, uh, you know, you put a configuration into your application class, all that stuff gets merged together and it's presented to the component. And if that's, that component then takes that configuration information and it uses it to call new and return, and it returns the instance. Question on that before I move on to the next bit? It might get a little clearer too. I've got some hard examples coming up. Now, the third piece of component that is important is optional. Uh, is a method called accept context. So what is accept context? Basically, the way what accept context does is, after your application is being created, after you set up components as run, after Catalyst is called component to return an instance of your component, and then registers that, it puts that aside. And then when you actually call for the component, like by saying C model or C view, right? It then looks at that that component during that calling time, and it looks and it examines it, and if that, if that component has a method called accept context, during request time, it then calls accept context, and it passes the context 
self, which is the blessed version of the of the component that, that, that of the component that the method component returned. It returns C context. I got to caveat that because in some cases it can actually return the application class. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. But in general, you're looking for the actual context, which contains things like the request and the response and the body parameters, and you know you can use it to do all sorts of things like look up, uh, look up other components and tons of other things. And of course, any arguments that are getting passed to the to the uh, component call. Okay, and what you do with this. You can do whatever you want with it, but except kind of context should return something. I usually it returns an instance of something, but you could actually return you know a, a literal a number or a string, whatever you want. To be useful, generally you're returning an, an, a uh, a blessed object, and usually you're using except context because you want to return a blessed object that has in some way been informed by the context, by the request, by the response, by something that's happening. During that, during the process where Catalyst has gotten a request from a client and it's preparing a response, okay. So those are the three things. Again, I recommend go, go definitely go take a look at the code for that. So let's look at stuff. So basically, model views and controls, they every one of them inherit, inherit from Catalyst component. There are two things that you have to think about when trying to fully grasp how a component is used within your application. Lifecycle and dependency management. So lifecycle is going to refer to how long does that object live. And dependency management is going to be about how is that object created. Let's talk about lifecycle. So let me just ask, anybody know what the different kinds of life cycles uh, for Catalyst would, might be? You already saw one, but anyway. <laughs> What's one? Uh, sorry, what? Anyone know? <clears throat> okay. Okay. Take a job blank. Okay, so... If you're, the first life cycle is application. With application, application life cycle or application scope, that basically means that your instance of the of the component, model view control, is created once during set of components. So in other words, whatever your component method returns, that gets associated with the application. Think of it, it's it's basically like a singleton, right? You get one, and every request has access to it. Right. So the upside to it is that you only you, you pay for the cost of instantiation once during startup, which is usually not seen as an issue. So it's it's the best for for performance purposes. But its course is limited because it's not something that can encapsulate uh, logic associated with a particular request. And another limitation is when we when we talk about dependency management a little bit later is that you can only depend on you know, literal strings and other application scope components in order to create. So here's an example. Okay. So here's an application. Here, let's say you want a model. Uh, you want to encapsulate information about the application. You're going to expose it as part of um, some sort of meta you know, lookup as part of your unary application. You, you, you want to you know, be able to look up and find out you know, what version of your application is out on, on the web and, what the license is and copyright. You want to expose that information through a model. Okay. So here's a model uh, using Moose. It's and it just extends Catalyst component and nothing else. Okay. Very simple. Now when you go to uh, configure I, configure this, you might do it some you know, way like you might do something like this during in your uh, in your application class. You're going to set the, you know, the various uh, fields, version, license, and copyright, and it's just all static stuff. So when I, when you look at this, does this all make sense? Have you all seen this kind of thing before? Are you following it? Yep, absolutely. Okay. Now this here, you might you might end up putting this into like a JSON file or config general or something using config loader. Okay, but you can just put it straight into your application stuff less as well. Okay. And so that's and 
you might use it like this, right? And here's a here's a control that's exposing it, you know, in some way. You're going to you're going to get the meta object and do something with it. Send it to the log, or you know, you'll you'll send it to a view or something like that. And it's straightforward. Every request gets the exact same instance. You never pay to make a new one. Some things to other things to remember about an application scoped uh, a component is that you're never going to pay arguments to it, right? Because they've already been made, so all the component instantiation has already happened. And the upside, again, the biggest upside is the impact of creating it happens during the application start. And that's, by the way, is why uh, all Catalyst controllers are application scoped, right? Uh, yeah, if you may have wondered about, about things like that, is that the thinking is is that if you if you had to create new controllers every for every request, it might be onerous. Um, it might be interesting to play with someday. But in general, uh, if you go and you look at the Catalyst controller source code, you see that it, it inherits directly from Catalyst component, and it doesn't do anything but accept context. The context gets set as an argument to the action. Okay. Let's talk now about what I call context scope, although I, I, it's actually not a particularly great name for it. I can't come up with anything better. I, I'm calling it context scope because it's a component that does do the accept context, does, it, that does implement accept context um, in its interface. And as I said, uh, when, the comp when that component is requested in your action uh, or wherever you're requesting it by calling C model or C view or whatever, um, uh, Catalyst behind the scenes, as it goes to retrieve that instance, looks at it and says, "Hey, this is, this this instance has a method called accept context. Let's invoke it." Okay, and when it invokes it, it passes it passes the context. So again, that method gets access to things like the request, the response, uh, and you can look up other models and so forth with it. Okay, uh, and. Like application scoping, you can depend on literals and other application scope components, but you can also depend on other context scope components as well. So it's a little more flexible, right, because it allows you to do more. Basically, the, the, the current context is it allows you to inform the component. So let's look at an example of how you might do something like this. Let's take the previous example and let's, in, let's change it a little bit so that it's got some information about it that's about the context. Okay, so I'm going to add here uh, an attribute called total requests. Um, now, I'm re making it not required, I'm making it nullable. Why, why is that? Anybody want to guess? Anyone? It has to be nullable because remember, during setup components, Catalyst is going to call component on this. And then component is going to look at configuration and it's going to create the object. And because the total number of requests is not associated with the application, it's associated with the running application with the context, we don't have that information yet. Okay? So, Version, license, copyright, that all can all be part of configuration. Total request, we don't know what it is. So we're, we're going to say it's there, but it's it's not required. Otherwise, what would end up happening is when you go to create the component, you, you would get a missing, you know, total request required, and you don't you give it. When are we giving it? Down here during accept context time, I'm taking, so self. Self is going to be an instance of my app model, model application meta. Uh, I'm getting the rep on it so that I can get the class, right? And then I'm going to call new. So I'm going to make a new version of, of this model. And that new version of the model is going to have version license copyright, which is going to be copied from the, from the one that, that um, set of components has made, but it's going to add the, it's going to add the count, which is, which is actually associated with your, with, 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 uh, your context. And it returns it. Questions about this? Okay. Yeah, I just have a quick uh, sidetrack question about uh, Moose's required versus um, 
So uh, the way I understood required was that it meant um, required just means it has to have a value, and that value could also be undefined. So you could also write that as saying required one, but saying like is a maybe. I could, I could do I could do other things here. I actually did, the next slide I'm going to show you what I would actually prefer to do. But I, okay. I wanted to give you a, a, a simple version of this. That yeah, no, that makes actually, sense. But yes, you're right. You could say it's required, but say it's allowed to be undefined, right? Okay, okay. Uh, something like that, okay? So there's a couple of different ways. I would consider all those to be fudges, okay? What I really would prefer to do is I prefer to make, I, if I'm going to take this approach, I prefer that the component be a factory, okay, which is okay. something like this, okay? So... I'm going to create a model application meta factory, which uses my app application meta, which we'll look at in a moment. Application meta factory has the three app attributes that we know up front, and that's going to be part of your, your application configuration. But then when I call accept context, I'm going to actually return the thing that I want to have in, the, um, in, in, in my actions or wherever I'm asking for it. Right, so I'm going to grab. Basically, I'm 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 making a factory method here that's returning the thing that I really want with the information that I have, but I'm adding the bit that I need, which is the total requests. Right, so the implementation of my app meta would look like this. I'm going to use moo over moose because remember I'm making a new one every time you're asking for it. Uh, moo is faster at doing in object of creation than moose. So I usually prefer to use Moo or something more lightweight when I'm doing uh, when I'm doing this in Catalyst where it's a where it's a context scope. Okay, it's just not to slow it down. But you see the difference here is that application meta has version license copyright, which is being copied over from the factory, and it's got the extra thing that's required. Mm -hmm. This is how I prefer to do it. It's more classes, but I think it's less ambiguity as to. I personally hate like null and undefined stuff. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, I think it, it causes trouble. Okay. Same. All right. So, question about this. Maybe it might help if I added a slide here that showed that showed you me using it in a in a in a controller. But it would be very similar to the one we did here. Right, you know, it would be except that you would have a, you would have the extra count information as part of the model. Mm -hmm. So, talk about just to summarize context scoping. The thing that's great about context scope is that you can use it to build any kind of scope that you want. Right, you can have you can use it to create a scope associated with the session with the request, with a particular workflow. You can even use it to mock application scoping by just simply returning the original component, right? So with, with application scope, I'm sorry, with, um, with, with context scope, but accepts context, you can do whatever you want, right? <clears throat> and it allows your component instantiation, the thing that accept context is returning, it can depend on everything. Okay? It can depend on other components, whether they're application scoped or whether they are Context scope, and it can it can count on any part of the request, you know, body parameters, the arguments. You can put it, everything can go into that that, that that you want. The only thing is, is the wiring is all manual, so you have to. Put, it has to be part of the accept context method. Okay, so when I talk about dependency injection, and, and you know, or people talk about a version of control, um, in classic inversion of control, a lot of inversion of control containers have auto wiring scenarios where your model can say, uh, I need to have a this type of object, and the behind the scenes it, it goes and finds it for you. Uh, in Catalyst, we're not quite that far because um, we can't do the inference, the type constraint inference. Uh, but using except context, you can create, you can do all the manual hookup that you want. Uh, and like I say, I recommend using Moo or you know the the most lightweight object creation you can think of because you know you're creating objects every time it's it's called which can be a lot okay again the context scope can be used to build any other type of scope I'll give some examples of that in a little bit okay so 
Again, here's, a, here's an example of what we call per request lifecycle. So the problem with, with this version here, right, <clears throat> every time you call for you know, application meta factory, you're going to get a new one, right? So like even if you have, even if you call for it two or three times and say the same request, it's going to create a new one each time, which is a little silly, right? So uh, a, a per request lifecycle might be a scenario where you're creating the method, you're creating the instance once per request. So here's how you might do that. In my accept context, I'm going to uh, down here on this line. Now, why am I saying C or app? Um, even though accept context is it's there to accept the, the C, the context, there are scenarios in which accept context may receive the application class. For example, if you are polling for the components uh, from the application class, like if you do from, say, a script or something. So uh, now, if, if I had my way, accept component would die. Except context would die if it wasn't a context, but it's been that way since like 2006, and so it's actually in the documentation that you should write your um, your accept context class smart enough to be able to, to do something reasonably intelligent if it re if it gets an application as opposed to context. Or if you want to have it die because it doesn't have the required information, you need to say die. I need to, this needs to be run in context. Okay. Uh, but in any case, what am I doing here is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking in the stash, and if the stash has the instance, I'm returning it. Otherwise, I'm going to build it. Okay. And what would then now happen is that you could call this method, you could call for this uh, component 50 times in the same request cycle, and it would only create the instance once. This is such a useful pattern that there's actually a a component, uh, a role uh, on CPAN called Catalyst Component Instance for Context that encapsulates this concept for you, which is what I recommend you use uh, if you have if you're trying to do this particular uh, pattern. Uh, but I just wanted to show you what it was doing behind the scenes. You could actually even look at the source code. Okay, so in this case, um, it's it's got accept context, but you're only getting one version of it per request. Okay, so you save yourself if you're calling it a lot. Questions about that? No, nothing here. Okay. All right, so let me just give you a sketch of what a per session life cycle might look like. So uh, in this case, uh, you might have a scenario where uh, instead, instead of creating the object, you're going to, you expect that the object, you know, do implement a method like thaw and freeze. Which which gets information from the session or puts information into the session, right? And so what you can have here is is a model that is created once per session, and you can store the information across, you know, the the, the, the entire session for the user. Um, there's actually an easier way to do this, which I'll show you in a little bit. But again, this is a sketch of how that might work, right? Where you're getting the information, it's either you're either getting it out of that, you're either getting it from the stash. Or if it's not there, you got to go create it, and you're going to create it once by calling thaw, uh, and you're going to give it the session information. So the session is going to store some sort of token that helps you to restore the the uh, the instance, maybe a database ID row, okay? Or it could contain all the fields. <clears throat> you could do it that way if you want, although I recommend not because uh, then your sessions get very big. Okay, so life cycles for components. What am I missing? What are your thoughts? Scary stuff. Think about it, and I'll come back to it uh, at, at the end. All right. All right, so now I, let's talk about, remember I said there was two things to think about. There was the life cycles and dependency injection. So uh, let me give an example of dependency injection. I talked before about, like, except context, it gets the, it gets the context, and you could use it to do stuff like, you know, get information from other models. So here's an example of a model that uh, that has an attribute called user that uh, wants to get the information from the database, you know, the result set from schema user. 
So you could use this, for example, to encapsulate some logic uh, 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 that requires, say, the database and maybe the logging and a couple other things. Uh, another example, this is actually something I, I used to do quite often. You might have a form based on, say, HTML form handler. Can people use HTML form handler, you know what I'm talking about? Is there reason? Nobody's used it? I used to work with Gerda when she like built it. Not in uh, not in production code. We played with it, but no, I don't use it typically. Okay, well in any case it doesn't matter so much. It's just a it's just a it's a it's, it's a system for encapsulating uh, how a uh, doing validation on, on form input output. And you know, it, it, in order to do validation on the form you need the parameters, the body parameters. And you might, in order to say process a login form, you might you might need access to the schema, right? To the user schema, because you want to check to see whether or not the the, the user you're trying to log in um, is is actually in the database, right? So you're, you know, you could encapsulate the creation of this uh, with a little um, component that that does a lot of the the work for you, and then you could reuse it in several places. So. I've been showing you a lot of like models, like actually building models, but in general, the best practice is not to write a model if you can avoid it. For the most part, there are common um, a thing, there are common encapsulations uh, that you could use uh, for to 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 adapt a standalone class from your project into Catalyst and. That's really the best way to do it because it, it's great for you to be able to like do standalone testing without having to invoke Catalyst. So, in other words, you write a class and use a model adapter or use model injection. Okay. So let's talk about those things. So Catalyst model adapter. Have anybody seen Catalyst model adapter? I uh, yeah, for sure. Remember years ago, I believe. Yeah, it's a lot easy. It's very easy to use. Right. Okay. So this is basically uh, you create your class, uh, standalone class. And then uh, you create a model. Well, it's a cool Catalyst model adapter, but by the way, you can use it to create views as well. Um, it should have been called Catalyst component adapter. Um, but uh, in any case, uh, you can use this to create application factory per, per request scoped um, versions of your class. I'm not going to go into detail here because this has been covered by other people. If I did it in the app, see, I might. Um, if, if people think it should think about it, let me know what you think. I want to talk about injection because that's something that's new that was added to Catalyst in 5990. Uh, and uh, we had a component injection, and then we created some plugins on top of that uh, in order to expose, give it more, more details. It's less battle tested than Catalyst model adapter. Uh, I asked uh, for a code review on it. Matt Trout said he thought it was over engineered, but didn't give me any additional details. I would love people to play with some of this stuff, so I want to talk about it a little bit, and I'm hoping you're going to play with it and use it in your applications and tell me what's wrong with it. Okay, so here's, an, here's a, here's a, uh, a Catalyst-based uh, class, right? Now, my app, you're saying use Catalyst. I'm using these two um, plugins, Injection Helpers and Map Component Dependencies. So let's talk about what's going on there, okay? And I'm also importing some... Uh, uh, some subroutines uh, through Catalyst plugin map component dependencies. I'm, I'm bringing all the um, I'm bringing all the inputs I I imports. So uh, in Catalyst 590, we added this new pa um, package method called inject components, uh, which out of the box allows you to directly inject um, any Catalyst component into your application without having to subclass it. So here's an example. In the past, and you say you were using DBX class and using Catalyst model DBX class schema, you would have to you you would create you would create a, a you know a, a basically an empty class you know my app model schema, and then my app model schema would you know say you know would say use base or extends Catalyst model DBX you know DBX schema, and there wouldn't be anything in, in else in it. It would just be a it would just be there to extend it. Okay. Um, that's great in the cases where sometimes you might need to extend the components, but uh, if you're just starting off a simple project, you can just simply say, I'm going to inject this component directly into my application without having to actually even go in and make a base class. 
And then later on, you can configure it uh, down here under package config, oops, the way uh, you would normally expect it. So it's basically it, component injection. Is, it, it, it'll, it's just a, uh, it's a way of using configuration to bring components into your application without actually having to go and create a lot of base classes. And you could later on go and make the base class if you need to. Like you, you decide down the road that you need to make your own, you know, modified version of Catalyst Model to the X class schema. Uh, you know, knock yourself out. You can remove the inject component line and, and then go make a base class that does it. Okay. Uh, but in any case, this is how it is here. So uh, that's out of the box. Inject, uh, Catalyst plugin injection helpers build upon inject components to say that you can now say, instead of from component, you can say from class, okay? You can say from class, and you can name the class, and then you can set the scope. So you can say the default application scope, or you can say per request, uh, factory, um, and it even has, um, uh, Injection Helpers has an implementation of per session uh, that's part of it. If it's a per session scope, your class needs to implement thaw and freeze methods in order to, you know, serialize and deserialize it. Okay. So I write, I mean, if you're interested in that, go take a look at the documentation. If that seems like fun, cool stuff that you would love to have heard more about, tell me, tell me after this presentation is over, and if I go do it at Yapsi, I'll add more stuff. But again, I have no idea what people are interested in. Uh, now down here, um, so what about Map Components dependencies uh, plugin? So I was talking before about how uh, you can, in your accept context method, way back here, let's go back. So in accept context method, I'm saying I have a, an attribute called user result set that's, re, that's depending on the schema user, right? Uh, that's cool, but it's also like you have to do a lot of coding. So in this case, I have a, a, mod, I have a, a, a an entities model uh, that has a, a, a attribute called DBSC schema. And I'm simply saying it's dependent from model schema, which was def already defined through inject components. So that would basically be the same thing as creating a proxy class with an accept context that then said, you know, get the model schema and, and, and make it part of the instantiation. So this moves Catalyst a little bit closer toward classic inversion of control, right? Um, and it makes, again, your configuration is here in, your, your instantiation is part of configuration, right? You know, so you could maybe have a test configuration that says from, you know, test schema or something like that. So instead of actually having to create a, a connection to a database, you're just returning a testable implementation, right? Discussion or can I move on? I think we're good. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I, I personally haven't uh, used uh, the injection helpers uh, since that came out. So yeah, it's kind of cool. It's only been out since last since last summer. I don't know if anybody's using it. Yeah. That's why I'm presenting. <laughs> I would like people to use it and tell me what's wrong with it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. So like, okay, here model entities from class my app entities. I'm injecting it. What does my app entities look like? Well, it could just look like something like this. It's a root class. It has a DBIC schema that's required. Right, and how would you use it? Here's an example controller. Uh, I'm just asking for it, and I was able to do this exclusively through configuration at the application level. I didn't need to create any proxy classes, right? So this kind of can save you a lot of like bullet you know, boilerplate coding, uh, because and it also makes it so that you don't have hard-coded versions of your dependency mappings. Because I guess one of the problems with this is to go back. The problem with this is, is that your accept context is always calling model schema user. It's, you know, and, and that might be a problem if you wanted to, say, build a test instance of this, right, where you just want to return a mocked version of the user result set. Here, since I'm making it part of configuration, I could return something else. I could have a totally different configuration. So we look at it here. So a lot of times you could use it to encapsulate complex control logic or anything that uh, 
you might want to be reusable or, or tested in a standalone manner. Okay, so <laughs> I know this is this was wacky. You've probably never seen it, never seen this before. Okay, um, but uh, this is simply just building upon the con concepts that have been in Catalyst since 2006. Okay, building a little by little. Uh, let's look at some other possible wacky things. So um, I've been thinking a lot about dependency injection. And one thing that I one thing I don't love is that uh, in order to do the service lookup, you have to call C model or C view in the name. Okay, and that always bothered me a little bit because it meant that your controllers and your uh, your controllers were more tightly tied to the fact that they were running within an application context. Um, it would, in my mind, it would be ideal if you could test your controllers in a more standalone manner. Uh, that didn't require to have a, 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 an application context associated with it. So Catalyst Action Signatures is a, uh, a system uh, that enhances your controller uh, so that it, it, will, um, it will inspect the, sign the method signature for your actions, the prototype. Okay, so you see your model, view, okay, under entities or the sub not found is looking for view. Basically, what's going on here is it's um, it examines the uh, it examines your uh, your your signature and it makes those um, those things just simply available directly to the to the action. So this would be the same thing as saying my e equals c model, right? And it and it gets it, or the view is coming from you know c view. Uh, Action signatures can you can define it so that it's calling different models, or you can get from you, you can like say get arguments or, or whatever. It leads to I, quite often more concise controllers, but unfortunately, uh, no matter what I do, you never really get away from C because uh, if you look down in the middle of the uh, example here, when I need to build the URI. I still need the, I still need the C, right? so I've been trying to figure out how to kill C for my controllers, uh, and the one thing that's holding me back is that you end up needing to have C for in order to build uh, in order to build links. Uh, so still got to have them, but uh, maybe someday I'll we'll come up with something that works. So since it's something wacky, you might want to play with. Uh, <laughs> if you use it in production and it breaks, don't blame me. But I would love people to play with it and see whether or not they like it or they think it's stupid. But it basically it's just taking the, the concept of dependency injection and it's moving it to the to the uh, action level. Um, some other things I've been playing around with with the idea of components and different component scoping. Uh, one thing that I don't like about a lot uh, most of the Catalyst views is that. You, the way that they work is you get data from your model and you stuff it into the context stash and then you pass the stash onto the view. That model works not too poorly when you only have one view, but once you start getting into complex scenarios where, you, where you're doing um, uh, a lot of kinds of negotiation, you have different views, it starts to get really ugly. Um, and I find that it also gets, when an application gets older and gets to be big, you end up with, I don't even know what's in the stash anymore, right? So one thing that I've been trying to do is come up with ways of saying, why don't we see what, how, whether or not we can say a view, need, a view owns its own data rather than getting the data from the stash, right? So a Catalyst view JSON per request um, is a per request version of the JSON view. Uh, I'm, again, I'm adding it here using inject components. You could use it through the old-fashioned way by saying my app view JSON, you know, use base catalyst with JSON per request. That would, that would work fine too. I prefer to do it this way because it, it's less. You end up with less. You end up with less classes that have just like three lines in them, right? I mean, one of the things people always complain about catalyst is I got all these classes. You know, in order to do something simple, I got to make ten classes. But, okay, you don't have to anymore if you don't want to. But that's something that's stopping you from, from using catalyst. Here's an option. <laughs> uh, 
Now, this view, because it's a per request view, that means is that unlike the classic Catalyst view, which only is getting one version, its application scope, it's creating a new version of the JSON request once per, re per, per request, and you can associate your data with it. Um, and uh, because it's because it's it's aware, the actual object is aware of the uh, of the request and the response. Um, I created this this setup where you can actually just say uh, view JSON, and then you could call the you know the status on it. So I say I'm gonna you know I want to it's 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 I'm, I'm calling it created. Uh, so basically, it's got all these methods on it that are based on HTTP status codes, right? Uh, and uh, in this case, so what I have here is I can actually just simply return the result that I want without having to say use something like, um, I'm sure most of us have used um, Catalyst um, action render view, right? You know, you put the render view action class on your root end object and that forwards your stash onto whatever the view is, right? So that's sort of the classic way of doing it. Are we all familiar with that? I imagine. Yeah. Right, so that, that works okay when you have one view, okay, but when things get complicated, I just find that it gets ugly, and I find also it, you, you get up, you, you get this, you get this wackiness where you have an end method in your controller that becomes like a, a god-like action, where people put all sorts of crazy code and filtering, right, you know, to like try to, you, know, you end up with all these if-then clauses because it's, and, and it's completely decoupled from the usage, right? You know, um, so what I've been playing with here is the idea is, you know, if, if your view is per request, then the view can actually just go ahead and create the, re the response and just simply, just simply return it so that it's the, the, the creation of the response is associated with the action and not with the end action in the root controller totally, you know, maybe too much action to add a distance. So that was just something I'm playing with. And... Uh, you know, I did that for, I did a version of this for JSON, and because I also do HTML, just for fun, I did a version of this with micro template. Uh, so it, it basically works the same way if you're doing HTML. Um, you know, again, um, just playing with ideas around using per request, using models differently and using views differently from what we've been classically doing. Uh, nice. Sorry, go ahead. I just say nice. That's, that's a cool example. So again, you know, go go to look at it and you know, see. I, I sometimes I want to throw these things out there because you know, since 2007, you know, it's been like you know, Cal's action render view is like the official like thing, and people just carbon hold it without thinking about whether or not there's any another better approach. I don't know if this is a better approach. It's a different approach. I like I would like people to try things that are different because I've seen like render view end up becoming a mess. Okay, so. I don't know. This is my thought about one way to, to clarify the mess is to kill the stash, say that your view owns its own data, and that the view can go ahead and create the response at the point at which you, you want to use it. Instead of instead of like saying you know, you know you get to the end point and then it, it invokes end and you know it gets very decoupled. Uh, and another one, again we're kind of running a little late, so I'll just blow through this, but I, there's a, and again another um, another uh, context model that I made based on form handler. You guys didn't even play form handler, so I won't go into it too much detail. Uh, but the idea here is that um, you're encapsulating creation of, of an HTML form handler form, and this encapsulation does things like if it's a post type request, it gets the body data and it processes it and, and it gets it all ready for you. <coughs> so you're not you know, a lot of that kind of boilerplate stuff that you might see all, all over the place is encapsulated. Right. Uh, so maybe I'll just skip through this because I'm getting a little late. But, uh, so I think you guys get the idea. There's a, in addition to the things that I've shown uh, with, um, you know, with uh, injection helpers and, and math component dependencies, I'm, I'm throwing out a couple of ideas. You know, per request JSON view or per request micro template. You know, a model of four HTML flow handler. These all these might not be great ideas. I don't know, uh, but they're all building upon a more complex usage of uh, a, a more maybe full comp usage of the features that have been built in the catalyst since 2006-2007. That we that I in general I don't see people take advantage of. So these are all out there on C plan for people to go play with. 
you know, check it out and see whether or not it actually helps your code, if it makes it better or not. I think that, that it, it, may, it will make code better because, again, you're programming, you're, you're decoupling instance creation from the usage, uh, and, you're, and you're working as an interface, not an implementation. Uh, I'll send this around. These are all links to the thing, different things that I showed. Uh, so again, you know, to the key concepts, if you don't remember, discovery, lookup, pain suggestion, different life cycles. On, we have component adapter on CPAN. We have component injection. I would love people to see your component stuff. I think it's, it might be cool. In the end, we have to do better, but it's out there. For them. Let me uh, let go of the screen share. Sorry, we're losing a little. The audio is cutting out. There we go. Uh, let go of the screen share. There we go. Good. No. Anybody know how to stop screen share without like this? You look. It's good. It's back to your video. Okay. You're good. Cool. cool. Nice. Oh, those are some great examples. Uh, um, yeah, I think um, from from my uh, experience, I've really only used like model adapter to to build my models in Catalyst. So I never really even uh, went through the process of even having to extend a Catalyst component to to get that to work. So that's kind of cool to see the evolution of how that is pulled together. Cool. Thanks. So uh, go ahead. No, no, just some bad feedback. Oh, bad feedback from myself. All right. <laughs> yeah, you guys have any questions here in the in the group? No, I don't think so. I was about to be very afraid of the storing objects in your session until I discovered that Catalyst session is very different from um, Mojo's session. Not that you couldn't do it, but just a little bit. I was, I was worried, and then, of course, it looks fine when I look into Catalyst sessions. Well, they, I mean, the main thing would be is uh, uh, if you were interested in playing with that, you could look at the, you know, the, at the, at the um, uh, Catalyst. Uh, let me get that. So at, at Catalyst, at the Catalyst plugin injection helper, um, there's, a, there's a per session helper. Uh, and basically, your model needs to implement freeze and thaw. Uh, and what I tell, what I what I recommend, and it's in the docs, is I, I don't think you should freeze the entire object. Uh, maybe just freeze like you know an ID that you can use to restore the object from would be would be would probably be better. Right. But it's also stored server side. Uh, the uh, yes, the session is going to be stored. Whatever you stick the session in, and then yes, if what if you're going to be restoring it, you it'll be stored, you know, in whatever storage system you use. So yeah, there's of course there's always there's going to be overhead in restoring it. But I think the main thing would be is like the thing that might be cool with the per session uh, model is that you could use it to encapsulate, say, like I don't know, uh, you know, a, a uh, an account creation wizard, right? You know, we, quite often we have these like you know. Uh, uh, these uh, workflows that, that span across, say, three or four screens. And usually the logic for this stuff is like crazy, you know, uh, all the way I have really seen it. Uh, and it might be kind of neat to just have, like, you know, an object that just is like it, it knows how to rebuild itself um, and it knows about its own state, right, you know. Uh, and then you just you can just simply rely on it being there. Well, yeah, I've, I've done similar things where I've stored you know, a, a JSON-ish representation of an object in a, in a session and then use that to rebuild an object. I was right. more worried about the actual storable, you know, slinging storable around. Scary. Yeah. But no, I agree. I would definitely wouldn't do that. You know, it's a little like is like that there's that uh, MooseX storage right. thing that allows you to, like, did, did serialize your Moose object to something. Uh, and I've seen people use that, uh, you know, I mean, basically, this is just an abstraction of that concept, uh, you know, that yeah. lets you get back to it, um, and perhaps, 
you know, again, like, it, it, it's building on stuff built into Catalyst. Hopefully it's less weird. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot, of the, a lot of these ideas people haven't really played with, you know, for better or worse. Maybe maybe that's maybe the reason why no one ever played with it is because no, it's, it's more complicated than we need. I don't know. But uh, it's there. Oh, sure. Um, and if anybody has any, I'll send out the slides. Um, I would love to get your feedback on the slides, and let me know if you think this is the kind of thing that you think people might be excited to see at Yapsi, uh, and what what you would like me to change about it uh, if I were if I were to promote propose it to Yapsi as a presentation. Great. Yeah, I think it's I think it's definitely worthy of Yapsi. It's definitely a great um, uh, great talk for both. Um, Newer people at Catalyst, and also those that are well versed in it that uh, quite haven't quite seen the history of how Catalyst came about. So, yeah, I think it's great. Great, thank you uh, for inviting me to do this. Most appreciated. Oh yeah, thanks so much for taking the time to do it too, John. Really, really, really appreciate it. Everyone here also appreciates it, and uh, um, thanks to all of you that joined us online. Uh, glad things worked out pretty smooth tonight. Hope there wasn't too much echo, but. Uh, mm -hmm. Just yeah. a little bit, yeah. No, the connection in general seemed good. Uh, Google Hangout seems to be more uh, stable than Skype, so I'm glad we chose this. Yeah, yeah. And so it'll be archived now on the YouTube channel. And um, yeah, thanks again for everyone joining. And uh, hopefully we'll see you next month. Uh, we'll try to do the uh, on air hangouts every month. So um, if you can join us live, that's fantastic. Otherwise, it's always archived on on YouTube for watching later. So thanks again to John. And uh, have a good night, everyone. We'll see you next time. Great. I'm going to sign off now. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks, John. All right. Good night, everyone.